So it, it's about halfway. So why can't I scroll? Oh, that's right. You scroll. You scroll the opposite way. Anyway, I scroll down. You scroll up. All right. So it's uh, Apollo 16, 50 years. So uh, who'd have thought, eh? 50 years. We're still trying to get back to the moon. Anyway. So uh, we're calling this series Countdown to, well, Footsteps, Footsteps of the Moon was the original uh, idea, Countdown to Apollo 11, which we started back in, in uh, 2018, which is the 50th anniversary of 1968, which was the first man flight of Apollo after the um, Apollo 1 fire in 67. And... We decided we'd go through from all the steps going leading up to the moon landing, and now we've continued on. So uh, we had, m at that stage, we were doing monthly reports. Every month during, the, during our meetings, we were doing a quick update of all the things that happened because it was a frantic time back then, 68 to 69 particularly. You know, there were so many things happening, so many missions, happen missions happening, so many things being tested, developed, decisions being made, crews being selected, hardware being built it, it was an amazing period so um i urge you if you're able to we'll stick the link in the chat shortly uh, to go and have a look at that um at that series that playlist we've got on the space association youtube channel um so yeah, it culminated in the july 2019 meeting for the 50th anniversary of apollo 11 but we have decided to continue it not in quite so much detail just to, just in the month of the anniversary of the mission so what we'd normally do is start with what the world was looking like back in that day, 50 years ago, uh, back in that period, 50 years ago. So this is kind of leading in around the April 72 time frame, January to April. So the first scientific handheld calculator was introduced, the HP 35. I think I've got one of those in the garage somewhere. Uh, and January 29, Japanese soldier Suyuchi Yokio was discovered in Guam. This is 1972. He'd spent 28 years in the jungle, having failed to surrender after World War II. Wow. And February the 2nd, the last draft of the uh, conscription lottery in the US uh, was undertaken. Those, those draftees were never taken, called to duty. And February 4, Mariner 9 sends pictures as it orbits Mars. Continuing in February, uh, in 72, 20, February 21, Soviet unmanned spaceship Luna 20 lands on the moon. 2021, 21 to 28, US President Nixon makes his trip to China. He meets up with Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong Chairman Mao. Uh, 26th of February, Luna 20 comes back to, to Earth with 55 grams of lunar soil. And Pioneer 10 is launched from the Kennedy Space Center, uh, or Cape Kennedy, to be the first man-made spacecraft to leave the solar system eventually. And they're still in touch with it, I think, out of Tibbin Villa. Um, 72 in Australia, there wasn't too much going on. The Aboriginal tent embassy was constructed for the first time in front of the old Parliament House, which is now the old Parliament House, not the new one. And number 96 debuts on channel O slash channel 10. You're showing your age if you've ever watched that. Uh, top 10 back in April of 72, American Pie with Don McLean. Without you, Harry Nelson. Joy, I don't remember Apollo 100. I think I know most of those. Morning is Broken. I don't want to, I want to live in the wood band, Cat Stevens. Yeah, I think most people have got a copy of American Pie somewhere. All right, so let's get on to the mission of Apollo 16. It took place between the 16th of April and the 27th, back in 1972. So it was the 10th crewed Apollo mission. In the second J mission, which is extended and had a lunar rover vehicle, Apollo 15 had a lunar rover vehicle as well, so it was the first J mission. Um, the target was the Descartes Highlands, uh, chosen because some scientists expected to be an area formed by volcanic action, although that proved not to be the case. Can I get maybe look at the time? Yeah. 
So this is a coup. Ken Mattingly, command module pilot. John Young, the commander, and Charlie Duke, the lunar module pilot. People may recall the name Ken Mattingly. He was on another, well, he was assigned to an earlier mission. Um, that's him on the right with his, other, his buddies, Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell. He was going to be going to the moon on Apollo 13 as a command module pilot, but um, he ended up making a movie about that mission. Um, he was bumped off, suspected of him being exposed to measles, which never turned out to be the case. So I think good old Ken was the winner out of that whole debacle. He ended up going on Apollo 16 and having a very, a very nice mission and a lot of new things and additional things that were available to him on that extended mission. So well done, Ken. Um, August of 70, August 24th, 1971, um, they had the hardware at KSC and they did a docking test between the command module and the lunar module at the top right at the top corner. And September, the first stage of the Saturn V arrived at the VAB. November of 71, Young and Duke run through practice exercise in a lunar roving vehicle model. And then fast, we go to November the 2nd, 71, and they're actually aboard their flight hardware doing some tests with uh, the vehicle, the lunar module itself, the lunar roving vehicle, and all of their connections and equipment before the whole thing gets packed up and loaded into the lunar module. So here's the lunar module, uh, lunar module with the uh, uh, Lunar rover folded up and being put into the uh, side of the lunar module there. Got Charlie there with his gloves and just watching. And there's, you can see John Young at the back thinking about going for a smoke with his pipe. So all this time they were continuing training. November 17, 71, they were uh, inspecting the lunar rover and studying rock formations. Um, and simulated lunar traverse, inspecting, inspecting um, rocks, etc. I wonder where those 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 kits are that hang over their shoulders with the boxes. It'd be kind of fun to play around the back out. I think I think I actually made one of those when I was back in seventy one or seventy two out of a out of a, a a couple of boxes and a few bits and pieces and walked around the backyard. Um, December the 2nd, 71, Ken Mattingly suited up and training for his uh, his deep space EVA in the uh, flotation tank in at the uh, Manned Space Flight Centre. Johnson Space Centre is his name now. December 71, they participate in the final verification of the scientific instruments. So you can see you've got uh, John, John Young, uh, Charlie Duke and Fred Hayes there. Fred Hayes was a backup, uh, having a look at the, some of the equipment. Uh, there was a modification to the Saturn V rocket. Um, they actually restored four retro rockets to the first stage on Apollo 16, meaning that there would now be a total of eight, which was the case for Apollo 14, 13, 12, and 11, and, and 8. Uh, what happened was that they were, well, the, the rockets are used to minimise the distance of uh, collision possibility of collision between the first and second stages of the Saturn V. So what happens is when you launch, you're gonna you run you finish off your first stage. It's a bit hard to make out, but there's these sets of thrusters um, at the back of the first stage, pointing in direction of travel. So they fire and slow the sec the first stage down to give it maximum separation from the second stage and the rest of the vehicle. Um, it's quite a spectacular. You can kind of, I know this will come up on this, but these, I know you can see my arrow. These jets here are the rocket, the retro rockets firing into the direction of travel and creating this gigantic plume uh, to give that maximum separation. And then once that's done, so the four retro rockets had been admitted from the, omitted from uh, Apollo 15 to save weight, but they analysed it and showed that. Uh, the uh, stage became closer than expected after jettison. It was feared that they, if there were any, only four rockets and they had one fail, that it might actually be a collision. So they restored that back to 
that's eight. So here's the separation of the first and second stages, nice and clean, separated, etc. So the sequence goes one, two, and three. Thank goodness they didn't have that collision. So um, this is the so this is the location of I'm not sure if you can see my arrow where those retro thrusters rockets are put in under the fairings these fairings here where the fins are and you can kind of see the rockets in there hopefully um, you can see them sitting there inside underneath that fairing and this is a picture of the guy inside that that fairing uh, fitting well running mock-ups there but you can see them pointing up there's a rocket engine nozzle there pointing up in the direction so when it comes on separate they just fire blows off the um the fairing cover there and uh, fires into the direction of travel all right so then we finally got to december of 71 and they rolled out the saturn 5 and here's ken talk, having a chat to the uh the assembled crowd there and out at the pad on December 13. Meanwhile, well, shortly after, they were back out training, this time at Kennedy Space Centre with uh, uh, a 1G training lunar rover and uh, doing their experiments, etc., with the equipment. Uh, multiple issues then led the NASA managers to announce a one-month launch delay from uh, March to April. Uh, and later in the month, uh, they had more problems after a fuel tank on the command module was damaged during a test, and that required the whole stack to be rolled back. Gee, that sound familiar to anyone? Mm -hmm. um, to execute the replacement. And they actually had to de-stack um, the Apollo spacecraft at the top of the Saturn V. So you can see there on the left-hand side there, um, they take that off, they, they took the spacecraft out of the uh, VAB, out to the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building and then demated the command module from the service module and actually removed their heat shield. So it was deeply buried inside. Um, so while that was all happening, uh, they were still doing the training and January 28th, they were at the... Um, now I've had inside information, uh, from someone who was actually there when this photograph was taken and they've told me exactly what uh, John Young was saying. Keep in mind, Ken was on Apollo, or was on Apollo 13. Well, that's not really true. Um, so this is a still from a film showing them doing that work in the command module. Obviously, the bottom of the command module is there with the heat shields removed, and you can see him getting right into the into the guts of the command module there. All right, so they finally got all sorted out and they roll back out to the pad on the second try the 39 and once again i was able to find out what john young was thinking <laughs> he's got that thoughtful look in his mind isn't he that bloody ken made it everything he's done everything anyway uh okay so then uh march 9 charlie duke took his family out to um um this, the pad so have a look at their his rocket taking take your kids to work day and they even had, got to have a look inside the command module so uh, would have been pretty special you can see uh, uh gunter vent there making sure the kids don't push the blast off button 24th of march they meet the press 25th of march john young was out there uh, doing lunar landing vehicle training at Ellington Air Force Base. That's the flying bedstead. And then March 31, they roll out, walk out for a countdown demonstration test, which all went very well. And then April 10, only a few days before launch, um, they attached their uh, plaque to the leg of the Orion lunar module. Ken Crow attached, so you can see he's, he's inside the fairing or the or the, uh, the the adapter on the on the Saturn V rocket on the Apollo spacecraft, crawling through a hatch and then attaching the the um, the uh, plaque. 
Launch day, Apollo 16. They're undergoing tests there. Charlie Duke is about to board the command module there. You can see him look around going, let's go. I'm, I'm going. Look, that's, so this will be his first flight. So 12.54 uh, p.m. Eastern on the 16th, they blast off. That was 3.54 a.m. in Australia on the 17th. I'm not sure any of the gentlemen on this um, uh, on this uh, Zoom session was involved in that or watching that or awake for that. We can have a chat about that later. So April 16, the uh, um, picture on the left, they were still attached to the Saturn V rocket during the transposition docking. So that's when the command module and service module separates, turns around and goes back and plugs into the lunar module. And then um, they got rid of the, the uh, third stage and uh, now the docked Apollo 16 spacecraft is free to head on to the moon. Just a few shots here as the Earth is receding from them as they're heading out towards the moon. It was a three-day trip out to the moon. On the way there, on the 18th, they um, that one of the experiments was the, to gain some information about these light flashes that the moon-bound astronauts have been seeing. So they had done this helmet and face shield called the Apollo Light Flash Moving Emulsion Detector. Uh, so that's actually one of the astronauts here in the spacecraft wearing it. It's a bit hard to see, it's a bit dark, but you can get an idea. So they reported that they were flash at about one, it's once every 2.9 minutes, although Madeline didn't see any, and he reckoned he had poor night vision. So whether that's something that's related, I don't know. I wouldn't think a fighter pilot would have poor night vision, but anyway. All right, so finally they got uh, into lunar orbit on the 19th of April, and the next day, the April 20th, they separated from the command module, and uh, Madeline stayed up in Casper. Um, there was a delay um, caused by a problem in the service module. Bloody Ken Madeline. Um, anyway, they touched down after much decision and analysis uh, on the Descartes site um, later that day. So you can see them separating there from from each other. Finally landed. 8.23 p.m. Uh, Central Time, April 20. That's uh, 12.23 p.m. 21st in Australia. And if you look out the window. All right, so this is the landing site here and the planned EVA parts there. So... Um, they actually slept after they landed because of the delay in landing. They they were going to be too tired to be able to do the EVA straight away, which is kind of what they did on Apollo Eleven. So they did sleep. I don't know about you, but I don't know how I'd sleep when I'd just land on the moon. But anyway, so um, they descended the land, descended the ladder, and they became the ninth and tenth humans to let walk on the moon. All right, so EVA-1, they, um, they first they offload the lunar rover vehicle, rover vehicle and the ultraviolet camera spectrograph and other equipment. So you can see them on the right-hand side. They've set up the, uh, the equipment, the LSAP, uh, a bit away from the lunar module just to protect it from any debris and damage that might have been caused by the liftoff after they, when they left the moon. So left hand side you can see John Young and Charlie Duke there on the moon saluting the flag. Here's that camera we we're talking about, the ultraviolet camera and spectrograph. And here's an image that was taken of Earth using that camera, false, false colour, but uh, not sure what they learned about that, but yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, so Duke and Young were then out to the rim of Plum Crater with the lunar rover in the back. And that's Charlie on the right-hand side in the big picture and John on the left-hand side in the black and white and the lunar rover in the background there. Pretty steep-looking craters. Uh, this is a film frame of John Young driving the lunar rover vehicle. He was giving it a real workout. They nicknamed it the Grand Prix run. That EVA lasted 7 hours 11 minutes and they drove uh, 4.1 kilometers. April 2, the next 22, the next day, the second EVA, this was the plan to go out to uh, to follow that path there to Cinco, Cinco. 
and um, on the slope of Stone Mountain. And so these couple of shots of them working um, with sample collection kit in the foreground and uh, and Charlie taking a sample on the slope there of Stone Mountain. Actually, it's, I was looking at this picture before. I don't know whether it's, you can see it easily, but there's some tracks of the lunar rover there. And you can see it goes over here and looks like he stopped because there's a big rock there. He backs up, changes direction, and then goes back up and then he goes over some other big rocks there. So I think John Young was a bit of a daredevil driver from that, that limited amount of evidence I've been able to deduce. Good design by Boeing there. And they made two more stops on the drive back down Stone Mountain and uh, he found a younger looking crystalline rock. Um, they drove half mile west uh, to sample some ejector material from the South Ray Crater. And then they went off to the last stop where they collected additional samples, including some rock from beneath a rock that they overturned, which is quite interesting. So they actually pushed over a rock and got some sample of the soil or the regolith that was underneath that rock. I'm not sure what the end result of all that was. Um, an interesting shot in the middle there of the of the um, lunar rover control handle there, steering handle. Uh, yeah, so there's that rock I just spoke about where they flipped it over and pushed and sampled that area underneath that rock. So that second EVA lasted 7 hours and 23 minutes and they drove 11 kilometres on that particular one. EVA 3, the last EVA, this is where they headed up uh, north up to North Ray. And uh, this traverse they plan to travel four miles north to explore the area around the North Ray, which is the largest crater, 1,500 feet in diameter and 200 feet deep. Uh, that was the largest one explored. So you can see, I don't think John is down in the crater, but you can see it's quite a slope looking back up to Charlie uh, up there. Um, and you'll notice there's some scratches on that Film. Apparently there was a problem with that particular roll of film where the camera came out, but uh, it's all in all that roll of film. On the left-hand side, you can see looking down into the crater, you can see how quite steep that was. So I think at one stage, Mission Control was warning them about going too close. It was a lot worse on TV than probably what it was in real life, but um, it looks pretty steep. Um, uh, so this is a couple more shots here. Shadow Rock is underneath there, and Duke taking a sample of what they call Outhouse Rock. There's another big rock called House Rock, and there's another small one called Outhouse Rock, so I quite like that nickname. And that's Charlie taking uh, taking a sample. You can see the suit there on Charlie's suit there, just absolutely covered in dust. And obviously that has been and can, will continue to be a big problem on the moon with the amount of dust and the fine, sharp dust particles that gets into everything. Um, once again, talking about dust, Charlie's dusting off the Lunar Rover vehicle uh, battery radiator and um, and down the bottom there on the left hand side is the final position of the rover uh, in relation to the lunar module so this is where they had the camera pointed and they actually filmed the takeoff from the lunar module so they backed it off a reasonable distance so that it wouldn't um, get damaged by the takeoff but uh, be able to try and catch as much detail as they can Charlie Duke left a picture of his family on the lunar surface it's on the right hand side there and in Mission Control, uh, the fl NASA flight surgeon described the medical data they received from the Apollo 16 crew with with, Char with William or Bill Duke, who's a twin brother of Charlie. You can see the dead ringer to him. And also his uh, father-in-law, um, Dr. Sterling Calborn. Remarkable resemblance. So the final EVA, uh, uh, on the 23rd, they climbed the ladder, closed the hatch, repressurized, and they blasted off three hours later. That one lasted five hours, 40 minutes, bringing the total time outside to 20 hours and 14 minutes, and they drove a total of 26.8 uh, kilometers. So they covered quite a bit of distance. On 23rd, later that day, they took off uh, at 7.25 p.m. CST, uh, 11.25 a.m. in Australia on the 24th. And you can see the camera on the lunar rover was pointing at the at the lunar module, seeing the blast off there. And in six minutes after, they were in orbit and catching up to the command module. So you can see the lunar module asset stage there coming up. 
looking pretty beat up and worn out uh, by the time we got up there in orbit. On the way back to the Earth, uh, 25th of April, Ken Mattingly performed his 83-minute uh, EVA to retrieve film cassettes in the Sim Bay, and Charlie was uh, in the hatch helping him there. And I think Charlie tells a story that apparently one of them, I think it was Ken's wedding ring went missing at one stage and Charlie was there and apparently it went floating by him and he managed to grab it before it went out the hatch. So uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, so you can see a graph down the bottom there of a description of this deep space EVA. And uh, a couple of shots there of Ken. So once again, Ken was a big winner out of Apollo 13 giving to do a deep space EVA. One of only three humans in history have done that. 27th, they got back to Earth, uh, 9, oh, sorry, 7.45 UTC, that's 5.45 a.m. In, in Australia, the 28th. Um, and they were retrieved by the carrier uh, 37 minutes after the splashdown, so they got the uh, whole process pretty quick. Mind you, at this stage of the Apollo program, they weren't having to do the biological isolations and all the other nonsense that they were doing in the earlier missions. So it was fairly straightforward. And people may recall last, the last one of these, we talked about Apollo 15. One of the uh, Apollo 15 parachutes didn't deploy fully, so they had a quite a hard landing. But uh, I think they found the problem there, and, and the 16 landing was nice and smooth on the three chutes. So this is the uh, uh, command module um, after splashdown. And a couple of shots taken by the divers there floating around in the water, looking pretty beaten up by the flight through the atmosphere. So June of 72, uh, in the wake of the Apollo 15 postal scandal, postal cover scandal where the crew of Apollo 15, I think was mainly, mainly led by uh, Dave Scott, but anyway, they took all these postal covers without NASA's approval to sort of basically sell them to help with their uh, financial surety going forward. And NASA was not happy, so none of those guys ever flew again. So they were pulled off. They were supposed to be the backup for um, Apollo 17. And so NASA swapped two of them, um, Young and Duke, to be the backup for 17. Um, Mattingly was not willing or able to go and be the backup, so they got in Stu Wooster. Um, so they went on a train, again, just two months after they got back, and they did not get their global Apollo 16 world tour to visit all the countries like all the other guys they got to do. As you probably know, they didn't get to fly um, 17. Uh, so where are the spacecraft now? Well, CASPER uh, is now in Huntsville, Alabama. And looking a bit cleaner than it was in the ocean there with all that uh, ablative material or the, the capped on tape all peeled off in the hands of various collectors around the world now. Probably some of you guys have got some here. Uh, the ascent stage uh, separated from the, the command service module, but they lost control of it. It orbited the moon for about a year and they don't know where it impacted, which is interesting. And the S4B, the third stage, was deliberately crashed into the moon. However, due to a communication failure, and uh, they were not able to determine its exact location until 2016. And uh, that's a picture there of, of, uh, of Casper in Huntsville. And uh, just last week, for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16, Charlie Duke went along there to have a look at his old capsule and, and have a chat at a ceremony commemorating the mission. So uh, it would have been quite, quite special for him to have been there with that his old vehicle and also that display they've also got one of the parachutes from from Apollo 16 mission as well on display you can see it's a little bit above the command module there. Uh, so John Young he was born in uh, 1930 and passed away in 2018 he joined the group 2 astronaut corps back in 62 he was a pilot of Gemini 3 with Gus Grissom and he and Mike Collins were on Gemini 10 and he was back up in space again in May of 69 with uh, uh, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan. Um, he was a command module pilot in this one on Apollo 10. 
so very experienced astronaut. Wasn't finished with that though. In January 73, he was a chief of the space shuttle branch of the astronaut office. And then he became chief of the astronaut office after Al Shepard left. And he flew T-38s uh, uh, during the uh, approach and landing tests of the space shuttle Enterprise, which our friend Fred Hayes was flying. 1981 in April, he commanded STS-1, the first shuttle mission with Robert Crippen. 83 of November 83, he commanded STS-9, and they were both both flights were on Columbia. Eight, 74 to 87, he was the chief of the astronaut office, and I think there's a few people who've got stories about him in that role. And 20, 2004, he retired from NASA. And sadly, January 5th of 2018, he died at his home in Houston at the age of 87 and interred in Arlington Cemetery. Ken Mattingly is still kicking on. He's 86 years old now. He was selected in the fifth group. He was, as mentioned before, assigned as command module pilot in Apollo 13, but because of the potential contact with German measles, he was bumped off and Jack Swigert flew. Um, he played a large role in helping the crew solve a problem of power conservation during the re-entry. So there's the prime mission in the middle and the alternate mission crew as it flew on the bottom right hand side there with Jack Swigert. Yeah, of course he flew on Apollo 16 and served in astronaut managerial roles in the space shuttle development area. June 27 of 82 he commanded STS-4 and January 24, 1985 he flew a DOD a defense mission. <coughs> He retired from NASA in '85 and worked in the private sector. Um, he's currently working in a systems planning and analysis business in Virginia, so he's still kicking on. Charlie Duke, still kicking on, 86 years of old, years of age. You saw him before, looking at his old vehicle. 66, he was once again. He was selected in the fifth group. And he was also a member of the support group for Apollo 10. He was a Capcom on Apollo 11. And he, p people might remember hearing him after they landed. Roger, tran Tranquility, we've got a we copy on the ground. We've got a bunch, bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And he was a backup commander in the pod, lunar module pilot uh, on Apollo 13. He was named on Apollo 16 mission in, 20, in 71. Um, he became a committed Christian after his Apollo 16 flight and likes hunting, fishing, reading and playing golf. <laughs> this is a bit of an odd little story. Uh, prior to the mission of Apollo 16, they, the astronauts went into quarantine to make sure they didn't get sick. They were allowed out only to fly T-38s for an hour a day. However, the day before the liftoff, Apollo program director Rocco Patron saw someone he believed to be Duke at around the pool at Cocoa Beach Holiday Inn. He was furious and he called crew quarters demanding to know why Duke was out. And uh, it turned out he'd actually seen his twin brother, who we talked about before. This. <laughs> I'll tell you what, his twin brother, I reckon if he turned up at the Kennedy Space Center, he probably would have... Uh, uh, he probably would have... Uh, they probably lit him on the flight. He looks so much like him, it's amazing. Anyway, uh, Australia and Apollo 16, the few little stories, and the people on this call will probably know a lot more about this than me in more detail, but uh, John Saxon, uh, who was an operations supervisor, actually spoke with the crew of Orion on the lunar surface. Uh, just before the EVA, EVA 2, comms lines from Houston to Honeysuckle Creek were lost, though the lines from Houston, Honeysuckle Creek to Houston were, were not affected. So sitting inside the Orion and having their breakfast, John and Young and Charlie Duke were discussing with Capcom Tony England, the upcoming EVA. Um, but then they they realised that they weren't actually getting any back, anything back from Houston. So in order to inform the crew what was happening, John uh, push, pushes the press to talk switch to send his voice to the transmitter, becoming the only Australian and possibly the only person outside Mission Control to speak with someone on the moon and I've got a little audio here of that something hang on excuse me
Okay, I did have the audio embedded, but it's lost. If you go to the amazing honeysucklecreek.net.au website by Colin McKellar and go to Apollo 16, you can actually hear the audio recording of John Saxon talking with the crew. So uh, when John came back, uh, came out to Australia in 1994 at the 25th anniversary of Apollo 11 at the Hellenic Club in Canberra, he and John Saxon toasted the mission with the Swan Lager. So they were talking about, John was talking about having a beer with the crew because he knew about Swan Lager. I think he'd been out to Australia previously. So they ended up having their beer together. So that was quite a special moment for them. Um, and Charlie has been out to Australia several times. He joined us in 2014 at the Southern FM studio in uh, in Mentone, as it was then, uh, and with an extended interview. You can see the picture on the left. That's Ch Charlie with myself and Andrew Rennie, the show's producer. And uh, Charlie was very knowledgeable and very accommodating to have us uh, spend time with him. He was an amazing guy. Um, he was back out in Australia in 2018 uh, for the tour of Mission Control uh, film with uh, flight director Jerry Griffin. And here's a picture of the Space Association Committee. Uh, and we presented them with some Crocodile Dundee hats and they were both absolutely delighted uh, with those hats. Um, Turned out that Charlie's head is not as big as we thought and um, we managed to check, get the size correct and then uh, Mike Abdul and I went over to Space Fest later that year and gave him the correct size hat so he was very happy about that and we were as well. All right, so now uh, as it stands today, uh, this is where the uh, uh, lunar module is. On the on the moon, you can see the lunar Orion descent stage. There is just uh, there the lunar rovers on the right hand side and the experiment package there. And uh, if you've got a good enough telescope or you get in lunar orbit, you can see it yourself. Actually, lunar reconnaissance orbiter, and also I think it's a Japanese um, lunar satellite, lunar lunar orbiter, which has got even better images of. of uh, the moon has been able to locate uh, the lunar landing sites as well, so they're there for going to go and take a look at. And that is the mission of Apollo 16. I hope I haven't made too many errors there, Mike or Bruce. Um, that's it. You can unmute yourself, make some comments, criticize me, whatever you like. Make some, add some extra information. I'm sure I made a few mistakes, but. No, very good presentation there, Pete. Thanks, George. Um, I'm just wondering with those long EVAs, and I guess maybe that's why Charlie Duke uh, in your recent picture was glad to be behind the glass. That command module and also the uh, lunar module would have reeked a bit, wouldn't it? Would have what? Would have been a bit ripe. Oh, yeah, I think it would have been, but, uh, yeah, I think they did a fairly a pretty good job of cleaning them out and preserving them. I mean, they they do go in on a regular basis. I, I mean, they're 50 years now. They go yeah. on a regular basis to make sure they're biologically very sterile so that things don't grow and, and corrode, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. yes, immediately after the mission, I'm sure they would have been a bit ripe. <laughs> because I'm, I was going to say, I mean, in those suits, and they were doing like such long EVAs, um, it didn't look like they had much room for a bathroom in there. Well, as you probably know, they had their uh, very rudimentary uh, waste management systems of urine bags and bags you stuck to your, your yeah. butt to, to defecate, and they put them in bags and threw them out the door at the end of the mission. So along with all the other equipment on the board, there's a lot of human waste. I think mm. we go back and study if people are interested. <laughs> um, was it Apollo 16 that had the command module that had a thruster? They would they was deservicing it after the landing on the on the carrier and they, they one of them had a leak. Well, no, that was 
that was a Skylab. Uh, that was an Apollo Soyuz test mission. Yeah, they had a th had a problem after they landed with one of the thrusters, and some people got um, exposure to tetra hydro hydrazine and etc. So, yeah. Um, I've got a couple of comments, uh, Peter, if you yes, want. Yes, please. Um, I'll just let everyone know, uh, Mike Din uh, is a space uh, tracker uh, from Honeysuckle Creek and then Tim and Billa. And uh, what he doesn't know about space and the Australian Space um, NASA part of the program is... is not, not quite, not quite. Anyway. <laughs> As it happens, I, I wasn't that close to 16. Uh, uh, as Bruce said earlier on, he'd been at JPL helping organize the uh, DSS 43 64 meter antenna uh, implementation. And I sort of followed him on in, in that role at uh, JPL in 72. So I was physically at uh, Pasadena during 16. Um, however, a, a couple of points. The, the camera, the camera on that lunar rover was commanded from Houston, I think mostly by Ed Fendel, but no doubt other Incos would have done the same thing. And one of the movies I saw, maybe, I can't remember which one it was, illustrated the fellow in that console having a couple of nice joysticks uh, to move the camera around uh, from a control point of view at Houston. And that was certainly not the case. Uh, each and every movement of the camera had to be punched in as a discrete command uh, up to the uh, rover to move the camera around, zoom it, pan it, tilt it. And, uh, and when I, I sat by Ed in Apollo 17 and he was telling me that he didn't get 16's liftoff right uh, because of all the different delays that had to be thought through, uh, pre-assumed, and it varied from tracking station to tracking station as to what that delay was. However, he claims he did get it right on Apollo 17. So if you, the, the most spectacular liftoff pictures, I think you'll find uh, came from 17. On, of course, Ed Fendel, uh, I don't know if people are aware, he was one of the proponents, if that's the right word, of not, not carrying television on Apollo. It, it gets a mention, uh, uh, in Chris Craft's book, I think. Chris Craft was horrified when Ed Mandel came out in some general meeting to say that. Anyway, it was overridden, and eventually Ed got this, or oh, what was it, Captain Video or some sort of award right. uh, in Europe for, for his coverage of uh, Apollo uh, on television. Uh, one other thing about John Young, uh, when we got him out in 94, um, I sort of started planning to get an astronaut out a year earlier than, for the 20, than the 25th anniversary. And uh, different people using a lot of different influences uh, got John Young to come out, which we're very happy about. Except that he had to be back in Houston for the actual 50th. So the celebration we had at the Hellenic Club was one week earlier than the, the official 50th. And it happened to synchronize with getting our first moon rock. Uh, again, I'd been pinging the front door paths and I had the NASA rep pinging the back door paths. And we ended up with a, a sizable piece of Apollo 11 moon rock, which by the way is still on display at Tipton Villa. And so it, although John, I, I had John telling John Saxon to go to Houston to pick up a piece of moon rock, which he did physically did. He went to moon rock school, did the job they said on how to carry a moon rock. Anyway, he rode first class or business class or something back to Australia, not through customs readily. But this synchronized more or less with John Young's uh, period here. So for PR and media purposes, we, we just pretended that John Young had brought the moon rock with him. Uh, he hadn't actually, but it was pure coincidence. But it worked out quite well. Uh, John did a number of interviews. I think one of them was with Darren Hinch um, during that particular uh, visit to Australia. Anyway, it was very helpful. Oh, and he gave me my retirement uh, prezi as part of that Hellenic Club uh, event. Um, and uh, 
that's about it really. Oh, I noticed that Mattingly on that video you were showing had a the red stripe on his helmet. Which I'm I'm surprised at. I thought they decided that the commander had the red stripes on their uh, on their on their uh, suits. But uh, if that was Mattingly, then uh, they made yep. it the commander of the part of the CM. I know the answer to this, uh, Mike. What they did is because um, they, like Madeline, didn't need the cover while he was in orbit. He actually used John Young's what they call lever, which is the outer co cover on his helmet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Charlie and John, rather than leaving them on the moon, which they'd done in up to Apollo fourteen, because they weren't doing a lot mid mid mission EVA, deep space EVA, on 15, 16, and 17, they kept those levers, those over helmets uh, for that deep space uh, EVA. So Very that's good. the reason. Yeah. Source of all knowledge here in this group. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I don't know whether, I hope this will come through. I managed to find that bit of audio of John Saxon talking to the crew. I, I'll play it now. It's, it goes about three minutes. It's a bit crackly, but People might enjoy it. Let me know if you can hear it properly. More level. It's, it's, it's a bit too low level, I think, Peter. Yeah, it's low level from, from Bruce. <laughs> Just while you're getting it organised, I was ha actually able to hijack that piece of moon rock that uh, Saxon brought back and get a photograph of myself with that piece of moon rock, which I uh, treasure. So you got a piece of the moon rock? No, a photograph of me <laughs> holding it. <laughs> I was going to say the Fed would be on to you. <laughs> yeah, no. It, it was quite heavy in, in a triangular piece of glass that was about uh, probably 10 mil thick. It's, it's, as I say, it's still on display, anybody who ever gets to, uh, to Tidbin Bella. And by the way, when Saxon talked to, uh, to the moon, he immediately fired a, a tweet off to me at JPL saying, hey, Mike, I've just uh, gone beating your uh, range. And, uh, and in addition, Sent commands. We had we could send commands directly from the operations consoles at the tracking station. We never did, but somewhere during Apollo 16, uh, Saxon did. I'm not sure when or why the details of that. But uh, as you said, Peter, there's a great a, a lot about Apollo 16 on uh, Carl McKellar's uh, website. Yeah, uh, I've just put the link to that audio in the chat so people can listen to it at their own own at their own leisure rather than trying to hear it over Zoom. Sorry, 